I'm going to talk briefly about small angle approximations, mostly because there are a couple of annoying bits within this topic that is probably worth hashing out a little bit. Not because it's especially complicated to do, we're going to do a quick example so you can see how that works, but they're a really nice idea, partly because they tie in well to what we've recently been doing with binomial expansion. You can see on the screen we've got a sine wave, a cosine wave, and there are also a straight line and a quadratic graph drawn on there. What you can hopefully make out is that if we're close enough to the origin, the sine wave is very well approximated by the straight line, and the cosine wave is well approximated by the quadratic. We had a bit of this on a previous PowerPoint, so we're not going to go into the detail of exactly which quadratic here, but you can see that those curves or that curve and that line well approximate those two trig functions provided theta is small enough. Exactly what small enough means essentially depends on how small you need the value to be or how accurate you need your approximation to be. Um, the approximations we're given in the formula book are essentially just the beginning of an infinite series in the same way that binomial expansion allows you to calculate the first few terms of an infinite expansion. Sine theta is roughly the same as theta. If you want to be more precise, you can model it with a cubic graph, theta minus theta cubed over three factorial. And if you want to be more precise still, you can try theta minus theta cubed over three factorial plus theta to the five over five factorial, and so on. Similarly, cos does a very similar thing. One minus theta squared over two factorial plus theta to the four over four factorial minus theta to the six over six factorial and so on. It's worth playing around with a bit of calculus. Try differentiating one and see what you get when you look at the expansion on the right hand side and compare to what you would expect from the graphs. Um, tan again, its own sort of thing, but we find that these are enough. If we just use the linear approximations for sine and tan, they're both pretty close to a y equals x graph. And the quadratic for cos allows us to use a curve, which is not quite as simple to use as a straight line, but it works very, very well when theta is fairly close to zero. What that means in practice is that equations that we previously couldn't solve very easily at all, potentially we can. And in particular, if you've got expressions that are big and complicated and messy, and there's no easy way to extract out what's going on, we can massively simplify them by making the assumption that theta is small. This is done in physics all the time, particularly with simple harmonic motion. If you've got a pendulum and you assume that theta is small, then it turns out you can model the motion of the pendulum very effectively by a nice straightforward sine wave. If you don't make the assumption that theta is small, things get complicated and messy very quickly, and it becomes next to impossible to extract out exactly what's going on. And you don't get a huge amount extra for your effort. You get something which is slightly more accurately representative of the motion of the pendulum, but it's not very different up to about 30 degrees. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference. It's when the thing starts swinging around itself and doing loop the loops that you start noticing there is some sort of discrepancy. So here's what it looks like to attack the question. Firstly, notice that we've got the results in the formula book, so make sure you look them up and you use them properly. And then when we say use them properly, we mean much like with binomial, if you had one plus three X in a bracket, everywhere where X appears, you replace it with three X in a bracket. If you don't put the bracket, you'll forget about squaring the three as well as the X. That happens here, cos of three theta means one minus three theta squared over two. Very, very common mistake to make this one. So watch out for it, avoid it. And if in doubt, test it, check that your answers make sense. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, in a similar way, sine two theta, well, that's a bit more straightforward. You're less likely to make a mistake with that one. And if you look at the big massy expression they've given you, there's a cos three theta, there's a sine theta and a sine two theta on the bottom. When we throw all these things in, we get something which still looks fairly messy. But in fact, the next step is not as complicated as you might think, because having dealt with all of the trig, we're left with something which is exclusively thetas and theta squareds and numbers. With a bit of simplifying, we can get it to the form they want. 
Now, even this, you might be looking at minus 18 theta squared plus 5 theta plus 2 and thinking it's all very well for him to factorise it, but that is going to take a little bit of thought. How would you even know, unless you were given a show that question, that you could factorise it? That's a fair point. I mean, you can use the calculator and check, and it's always a good idea to see if something can be factorised. But in this case, we know that it can be because they've told us it can be written as 9 theta plus 2. In fact, that's the reason I have a 9 theta plus 2 bracket, because if I'm expecting it to cancel down to something nice and linear, then the 1 minus 2 theta on the bottom has to cancel with the top. And if when it cancels, it leaves me with 9 theta plus 2, then I basically know what the factors have to be. All I would say is here, just because you can be clever and figure out what the factors should be does not mean you should shortcut the process of verifying that the factors really are this. I would quickly multiply the 9 theta and the minus 2 theta and check that we get minus 18 theta squared. You can deal with the 2 minus 2 theta and the 1 plus 9 theta in a similar way and then check your 2 times 1. It doesn't take long working this direction, but you can verify that these two things match. And then, of course, the 1 minus 2 theta on the bottom and the minus 2 theta plus 1 on the top cancel out nicely. We're dividing top and bottom by the same thing, so essentially we get 9 theta plus 2 all over 1. And that's exactly what they asked us to prove. Now, for the next bit, they say, hence, write down the value when theta is small. Well, I don't know about you, but I thought we were assuming theta was small right at the very beginning. That's the only reason we were allowed to use this whole cos theta is 1 minus theta squared over 2 thing and the sine theta is theta nonsense. The only reason we could use that is because we were assuming theta was a small value. But they're looking for something slightly different here. When they say, hence write down the value, they're looking for just a number. And here's where we get to the slightly vague question, what counts as small? We have this kind of thing cropping up in statistics a bit more often, where we're talking about um, what counts as a big sample size or what counts as um, a sufficiently small probability. And it usually depends on context, but there'll be a few general rules of thumb. And the same is true here. Context is important, but also there's some general rules of thumb we can use. In terms of the identities that you're provided with or the approximations that are in the formula book, the general rule of thumb is anything up to about 30 degrees gives you a pretty decent approximation and you absolutely can't use these if theta is bigger than one for the same kind of reason that you can't use binomial if x is one or bigger. Um, if you look back at the graphs, you'll see how good the approximations are when they're good and when they're not. But if theta is really, really small, and we're talking 0.01 or something like that, then 9 theta plus 2, you start to see that even something linear is more complicated than it needs to be. As theta gets smaller and smaller, that term gets closer and closer to 2. So in this case, we just say when theta is small, 9 theta plus 2 equals 2. You essentially make theta equal to 0. It's kind of what happens when you do the limiting process in differentiation from first principles and the idea behind it is that yes we can find a good way of writing this expression in terms of theta which will work when theta is pretty small like 0.2 or something um, but we can get a value when theta is really really small and that'll just be a single number we're essentially saying what's even simpler than a linear or a quadratic way of representing this constant constant will be great if we can come up with that so that's the idea and um, the last part is there an easy way to test the answer well if they had not given you the result for the first part maybe you need to test this as well and that's a little less obvious but still doable if we're claiming that the expression they gave us is roughly the same as 2 when theta is very very small pick a very very small number and put it in I mean you could argue that when theta is very, very small, we can use some even more basic approximations. Cos theta, you have to forgive my messy writing. It's no better on a computer than it is in person. Cos theta, if theta is basically zero, is one. And sine theta, if theta is basically zero, is zero. 
So if you go back and you sub in 1 and 0 instead of cos theta and sine theta, you find our entire fraction becomes 4 minus 2 over 1, which is the 2 that we had. Now, for the 9 theta plus 2, you might want to calculate it. But if you grab a calculator and do 9 lots of 0 0.1 plus 2, and then compare your answer to 4 lots of cos of 0.3, take away 2, plus 5 lots of sine 0.1 over 1 minus sine of 0.2, you should find that comes out pretty close to the same thing as 9 times 0.1 at 2. So you can try it with numbers, and you can check that everything works the way it should. Just briefly to finish off, um, there is a nice challenge question on page 135 that you might find useful. What I like about this one is that it gives you a different way to come at the small angle approximations. You don't have to just take our word for it or some vague, we'll talk about McLaurin series next year nonsense. You can generate this using what you already know about binomial. So it's not just that there are similarities with the way it looks and the way it feels. There is, in, in some sense, it's the same maths going on behind the scenes. If you set up the right sort of triangle, and you consider the fact that when the angle is small, we're essentially saying the sector of the circle that we're looking at is very, very similar to the right angle triangle. In other words, D and B are getting very close together, and therefore the angle between AC and B is very, very similar to what the angle would be if you get an angle between AC and D along the arc CD. If you set that up, you will find you end up with the square root of 1 minus x squared. And you can use binomial to break that apart and to get the first few terms. And you should be able to get an even more precise value for cos theta by expanding that a little further. You might not feel particularly comfortable doing a binomial expansion with 1 minus x squared as opposed to 1 minus x. And you might be thinking, well, let's do the expansion of 1 minus x to the half and multiply it by the expansion of 1 plus x to the half. And if so, that's some good thinking. But you don't necessarily have to. You can just replace x, not just with minus x or with 2x or a half x, but you can replace it with anything, including x squared. What that means is you'll have powers of x squared, which is why cos theta ends up being powers of theta squared. We have a theta to the 0 term at the beginning. We miss the theta to the 1 term. We have a theta squared term, and it will miss the theta cubed term, jumping straight to a theta to the 4 term but I'll let you play around with that in your own time.